afternoon from the campus of The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, and welcome to this Creative Pathfinders event. We are delighted that you're with us. Creative Pathfinders is a series of virtual conversations that traces the careers and highlights the accomplishments of Ohio State alumni in the arts. Initiated in 2020 by then director of the Barnett Center, Allison Crusetta, Creative Pathfinders celebrate the accomplishments of arts graduates and enrich our relationships with our alumni, now more than 600,000 worldwide. The series is a collaboration between the Barnett Center for Integrated Arts and Enterprise and a specific arts unit or center on our campus and is supported by the Office of Advancement within the College of Arts and Sciences at Ohio State. For those of you who are not familiar with the Barnett Center for Integrated Arts, let me share a little bit with you about that place. Uh, created by a generous gift from the Barnett family, the Barnett Center educates and prepares students for successful careers in the arts and related entrepreneurial fields, while also advancing student understanding of the arts, arts management, policy, and culture through entrepreneurial thought and action. Vibrant partnerships with each of the arts units and centers at Ohio State, other campus constituents, and the Columbus arts community are central to the mission of the center. The Barnett Center contributes to the curricular offerings focused on arts entrepreneurship and arts management by offering programs, workshops, working with students across disciplines, and housing the Barnett Fellows. For more information about the Barnett Center, you can visit us at barnettcenter.osu.edu. Allow me now to share a little bit with you about the moderator for this afternoon's conversation. That's Vita Berezina Blackburn, Senior Creative Technologist in the Ohio State Advanced Computing Center for the Arts and Design. Berezina Blackburn works on multidisciplinary research and creative projects with integration of motion capture, virtual production, virtual reality, and 3D modeling. Her animations have been part of performances and exhibits at numerous venues, including the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, the MIT Museum, and the Wexner Center for the Arts on our own campus, as well as PBS and international festivals such as Anima Mundi and Dance on Camera. In 2005, Berezina Blackburn received a Collaborative Creator New York Dance and Performance Award, otherwise known as a Bessie, for Landing Place, a mediated performance production by the B.B. Miller Dance Company. Berezina Blackburn also teaches several ACAD classes and workshops on motion capture, 3D modeling, and virtual reality. Welcome to our conversation this afternoon, Vita Berezina Blackburn. Thank you, Scott. Um, and um, thank you, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the Barnett Center and yourself for holding up the tradition of creative five Pathfinders in its second year. Um, it's uh, such a lovely opportunity for all of us to reconnect with our marvelous alums and um, learn what they've been up to. And um, I, in turn, would like to introduce um, Boris, Boris Willis, um, who is our um, guest today. And um, I think, Boris, you can come on into view while I'll um, um, in, give a little bit of your background. Willis is the founder of Black Russian Games and the dance vlog uh, danceaday.com. He's a chief artistic officer of Boris Willis Moves and an associate professor of computer game design at George Mason University. He has presented his work nationally and internationally. Um, his work has been exhibited recently at the Watermill Center, Fenwick Gallery, and the Candy Center. He has performed with City Dance Ensemble, Edgework, Edgeworks Dance Theater, Theater at the first, of the First Amendment, Liz Lerman Dance Exchange, Streb, and Company E. He has written papers and given talks on choreographic thinking, performance, and computer games at Bucknell University, DIGRA, Digital Games Research Association, Indicate, the Serious Games Conference, the East Coast Game Conference, and the National Dance Education Conference. He's a graduate of the Ohio State University with an MFA in dance, uh, George Mason University with a BFA in dance, and the University of North Carolina School of the Arts with a diploma in dance. So um, welcome, uh, welcome, Boris. Um, Thank I you. 
we have not um, seen each other in many years and um, I, looking at um, the many things that you have done, um, I'm eager to give you the opportunity to share with the viewers um, the highlights of, um, of your journey post um, grad school at OSU, which was uh, 2007, right? It was yep, yep, yep. when you finished up here. So without further ado, let's Okay, I'll uh, talk you through some of these. Um, so um, my dance company is Boris Willis Moves. Uh, and through that, I've been doing several dance projects over the years. Um, and let me just, just go back to sort of my interests, which is really this sort of idea of dance and technology and blending uh, animation and computer graphics and, and, and all those things. So. Uh, I did begin sort of in the 90s working with a gentleman by the name of John Simmons. Um, and we were uh, working on the basically what you see now as Animoji or Memoji if you have an iPhone or similar kinds of things on Android phones, but to send uh, movement across the internet um, and to be able to sort of move, move those um, animations back and forth. Um, which is why it's called Boolean Netscape Remix. Um, but in this work um, that we made together, I was basically um, this sort of nerdy professor type of guy who was uh, who had his animation come to life and uh, she would do things in cyberspace and I would do things with gravity. And we sort of contrasted those two things together. Um, um, you can't hear the sound, but I'll just sort of take you through a little bit of the um, the visuals here for this work. Um, sort of fast forward into so so we had two two ways of seeing the character. One was this live board, which was this sort of really cool um, sixty five inch computer screen that was a touch screen, which in the nineties was like the big thing. It was so exciting, and I was really uh, happy that I got to sort of work with this thing. Anyway, the idea is that she comes out of the sc this screen into my body and then she appears on the larger screen. And this is really the contrast between what you can do with the animation and, a, and an animated character. And then you contrast that with, you know, sort of the, the body and the weight of the, of the person. And she can do things that I can't do and I can do things that she can't do. Um, while at Ohio State, I worked on Abandoned Revolution, which was my thesis project um, or my, my final project, which was a live video game. And the premise of that was that I was the evil artistic director and I was going to grab all of my dancers, which you can see down in the bottom, and I would take them to the motion capture, the a ACAD into the motion capture lab and I'll steal all their movement and steal their bodies. Uh, and then I would create these things called choreobots and then uh, I could work them as long and as hard as I wanted to, and they would never get tired or hungry. But then it was the job of the audience to play these different uh, video games to bring them back to the theater. Um, and you can see the, the computers down in the front row there. Uh, so the audience was, would, would, were on different teams as they came into the theater, and then we would call them up and they would uh, perform. So the idea behind this was really sort of going back and forth between the video, which was the large screen that you see there, and then the live performance. So uh, they might run off stage, uh, and then you see the video that would continue the journey, and then they'd come back on stage. So it was a very complicated project. Um, it wasn't, you know, necessarily the most refined uh, in the end, but it really sort of led me on this journey that I'm that I'm on now, um, where I'm sort of working with the same idea. And I'll just sort of give you a little bit of um, running through. So here you can see that she's running off, off behind the curtain. The video comes on, and then I can do all kinds of, you know, cool prod, cool video tricks, if you will, um, for, for this uh, work. Uh, also, the music was done by David Morneau, who um, played live a Nintendo Game Boy. Uh, and he's actually still, I just talked to me the other day, he's still composing and playing music on a Nintendo Game Boy, which I think is totally, totally fascinating. Um, uh, so I saw a 
a similar kind uh, or I saw an exhibit from Epic Games, Ninja Theory, Three Lateral and Cubic Motion, where they had a live video, um, a live motion capture performance. So um, we didn't know what was happening at first, but what we found out was that there was a performer in a motion capture suit uh, inside of a game engine um, doing things in real time, sort of talking and speaking. I was really inspired by that. And um, so I wanted to make my own, I started this journey of like, how can I perform inside of a video game? And so I got the opportunity to, to be at TEDx Tyson's. And so I worked on that project where I was moving, we used a um, Connect camera, a Microsoft Connect camera. My colleague, Matt Nolan, uh, basically programmed these cubes that you see there. Uh, and to play music whenever uh, the 3D character interacted with them. And, um, and so that was sort of like the first sort of um, time that I could like be inside of a video game or have my movement inside of a video game with this character following me around. Now, it didn't work really well uh, because the character glitched out a lot, but it was like the first time that I sort of... Um, was able to sort of be inside of a video game. Uh, and there I am with Matt Nolan. Um, now, I know, Vita, you you did this as well, uh, but you had um, a, 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 a mo live motion capture um, with the Marcel Marceau project. I also did a similar thing with um, um, uh, the theater department at George Mason. Uh, so we had um, a sort of, we wasn't live, but it was motion captured using the motion capture uh, with the theater performance. But I was also last year able to work with Revision Dance Company. And what I was asked to do there was two different projects. One was an AR project where the people in the performance could sort of see uh, the dancers moving around, and this is just some some tests that I did uh, with the AR, having the dancers and the AR in the same space. And then we also did a virtual production uh, component of it, where we shot the dancers on a green screen, and then the images that you see in the background would change, um, uh, representing the 10-year progression of the street that we're on, and the 10 year progression of the dance company. So it was a 10, 10, 10 year anniversary. And we saw how that street changed over the 10 years. Uh, and this is just another shot of that. Uh, we can see this a different v view here of the street and the dancers sort of moving around together. So recently I worked with um, uh, the folks at George Mason who, um, uh, we're doing this project and they, they paired a bunch of us together. Um, uh, and I got to work with um, uh, the poet uh, Vivek Narayanan and um, we created this um, uh, thing called Encounters. We talked a lot about our encounters, our uh, interactions with people who didn't know us. And we wanted to make something that would sort of upend um, what they saw, how we looked. So we wrote these um, encounters or these, these moments that would happen. And I use uh, Unreal Engine and their MetaHuman system to animate the characters, um, both facially and the face and the body. And, and you would hear, um, uh, the, the, the poems or the encounters spoken by an AI voice. Uh, and we did several AI voices for each encounter. And then uh, every time you would play through this, it would be a different voice. Um, and and as the, the different scenes would play. Uh, so sometimes I did use motion capture uh, and dance or some other kind of special effects in there. And you would just sort of see those different um, those different encounters of those different moments. Uh, and every time uh, a random voice would play. Uh, I was asked by uh, choreographer, dancer, Stephen Nelson to uh, come up to New York uh, or to do a project with her in New York as well. Um, um, and um, I'm blanking on the name, but I know it's Mother's Monsters and something else, Matricide, but I can't think of the last name. Oh, hate it, hate it when that happens. But anyway, um, 
I did this work uh, called Hey Ma. Ma is my grandmother's, uh, what we called my, my grandmother. Um, and so I interviewed my sister and um, also using motion capture, using Unreal Engine, using the metahumans. Um, and what you're hearing is a conversation between my sister and I, as you basically going through these different uh, elements where we talk about different aspects of our family. I, I asked her about our parents. I asked her to describe, you know, how our parents, um, how we were like our parents. Um, uh, and then also asked her to talk about how our, our grandparents, what we knew of them, what we didn't know about them, our great grandparents as well. So there was a lot of um, talk between she and I just about our parents and um, it sort of ended with uh, more motion capture and more dancing as well. I also created um, a work uh, at the end of 2020. So we're going back a bit um, called The Owl, the Fish, the Maiden and He. Again, this is um, uh, using some motion capture, but also using video. And the way this one works is an interactive poem. And uh, the poem sort of walks you through um, this sort of medieval sounding poem, but it's also about the uh, police shootings of unarmed black people. Uh, the feeling that I was having was that as I was working on my creative work, I would hear the news of, you know, someone getting killed and they were unarmed or they were, you know, not dangerous. And so these moments like the one you see here would interrupt your uh, trying to go through the poem. So you'd be clicking on each word in the poem to sort of get like what is the correct order uh, and then as you get to the end um, of a section you might find another scene that would come up and um, it, that was also with a song that I uh, that I wrote while I was in residence at the Watermill Center up in New York uh, to, to sort of work on this project. And finally uh, almost funny, I also made a dance video game. So this, ga this game is um, called Natasha Game of Dance. I made this with Company E. Company E dancers did a lot of the motion capture. Um, you don't see it in the, the movement here, uh, but this is just the scene in the environment. Um, but basically, I call it a dance adventure game. You go through the world. You, uh, you, uh, your character, Natasha, eventually learns to dance. Um, and um, yeah. You, you get to perform in the castle at the end. And then uh, I was recently asked to contribute to uh, a wonderful book called Black Game Studies by my friend Lindsay Grace. And um, uh, so I wrote uh, uh, sort of a story in there just about you know, my experiences growing up and wanting to be a dancer and wanting to design games and the lost, um, the lost opportunity to to be a drummer, which I think if I had been able to do when I was a kid, uh, would have had a very different trajectory. Um, but that's it, didn't happen. Uh, but I did take some drum lessons while I was at Ohio State, so I feel good about that. But that's it. Uh, that's my that's my presentation. Well, um, you're you're such a multidimensional artist. You're um, you know. It, you obviously uh, dance and choreograph and uh, develop these um, uh, interactive elements and uh, in visuals. Can you talk a little bit about your creative process? You know, how do you start? How do you? How does the work grow? Uh, how did? Which point do you interface with other people and how do you communicate your vision? Um, because you know, in in this field, you obviously you know you're not alone. You're not working alone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the way I think about my work is I, I usually sort of have some idea percolating um, and then uh, perhaps I will, um, you know, sort of make little sections of, of an idea. So when I, when I was doing the, the owl, the fish, the maiden, and he, I knew I wanted it to be interactive. I knew I wanted it to have, uh, you know, but I didn't know what that really meant. Um, so I played around with it a few different things. Uh, one was, okay, so if I click on a word, uh, the word would also play a sound, but I want, wanted it to be the sound of the word. Uh, so I worked with an actress and uh, basically what she did was she read every word uh, that's in the poem. 
And then as you click on it, it'll tell you, but then if you don't get the order correct, you'll just start over. I didn't want it to be punishing. I wanted it to be really easy. So there's a couple of iterations to sort of get that working. Um, uh, and then, you know, at a certain point I had this poem and, but I, I wanted, it didn't, it felt very light and easy to me. I wanted something, um, I was, I was going through all these emotions and I was feeling all of this sort of like, you know, angst. Um, uh, and I, and I, I saw Carrie Mae Weems do a production at the Kennedy Center um, called um, uh, Amazing uh, Grace Notes. Uh, and I just, I just was like, okay, I, I really want to respond to, um, you know, these police, these police shootings. And so what I thought of was like, okay, so I can take this poem that I have, but what if I interrupt it? What if I shift it and change it um, to have the impact of I'm a creative, I'm being creative, I'm trying to figure these things out, and then this thing happens. I have to stop and have to come to contemplate and have to think about it. And then I go back to it. And so for me, that feeling of sort of going back and forth between those two ideas um, is basically how, how that came about. And I think I, I, I do that a lot with like just coming up with a sort of a seed of an idea and then trying to see how I can sort of expand it and, and, and make it, give it some more, some more depth. I also use what I call the, my, my, um, uh, principles of audience engagement, which are simplicity, surprise, transformation, and repetition. So what I want to do is in every piece, I want to look at it to say, the simplicity is, are, is the audience understanding what I'm doing? Do they understand where they are, what they're supposed to do, and what they're supposed to understand? Surprise has to be with, you know, I, I can't just have them under, just go through it, but I want to have within what's possible in the world I create, I want to be able to shock them, surprise them, do something that, that's unexpected. Transformation is the idea that I really want to make sure that in the process that something is different, significantly different from when they start it to when they end. And then I use repetition as a way to sort of balance that transformation to sort of ground them to say, you're, you're okay, you're supposed to be here now. This is the moment we're going to repeat this so that you understand that you're that you should be grounded in this moment that you don't have too much information coming at you, which I think goes back to the idea of simplicity. So those two work together. I uh, thank you for this insight. This is actually really a really cool um, set of uh, metrics to to measure the work and to to gauge when you're you know when it's balanced and, and when it's full. I yeah. really I really enjoyed going through this, and I want to um, let our attendees know that this is a downloadable experience, and we can share the link to uh, where yeah. it just runs on a PC. And I. I really enjoyed this interaction with a text that, you know, completely was purely an interaction with the order of the, uh, you know, of the poem, but um, it, it, there was enough, like you said, there was enough of this a, a balance between simplicity and uh, this momentum of wanting to find out what happens next. And yeah, uh, yeah, I yeah. found myself wanting to, you know, click quickly, but yet not stumbling upon the difficulty of doing that. It was... A, right. It, it was really a nice, nice balance. So thank you for that insight. Um, it has, and to speak a little bit more about that piece, did you also have some students working with you um, on, on that or, um, or not really? I may, I may have misunderstood that. So um, there were uh, several versions of what is the final version now. So I did uh -huh. have within my class, I did have uh, uh, some students sort of work on um, uh, sort of using the same idea, but not making my work. Sure. So they made their own versions of it. They were using the Microsoft Connect camera. Um, and so they, the, I just sort of gave them the idea. So we're gonna work around this idea of, of the owl. And they came up with something completely different from what I came up with. Uh -huh. 
That, that's that's fantastic because I, I also it also occurred to me as you were speaking about uh, you know trying to ensure all these elements in your work. I wonder to yeah. which degree they're informed by your experience as an educator who you know yeah, has yeah. to you know communicate and teach technology and at the same time balance the creative pursuit with that. And um, you know it's and you know you're right every work. Um, every body of work like that becomes an opportunity to invite other people and students to experience yeah. it, reinvent and augment it as well. Yeah, well, that was the thing, you know, I was sort of like, you know, looking at this idea of performing inside of a game. And I was thinking like, you know, with the connect at that time, it was like, you know, what, what, are, what are the what are the ways or what are the ways of thinking about games or interactive experiences that aren't just the same old thing? Mm -hmm. And how can I sort of push them to sort of you know, just open open themselves up to other kinds of experiences or other kinds of things that aren't necessarily going to be, you know, the next Fortnite or the next uh, Elden Ring. Um, but what other kinds of things can you can you think about or incorporate or use? Because these game engines are so they're they're incredible. They can do so many things. And if you're a, you know from my from my perspective, you're a game student then, you know, maybe that's not your focus or your goal, but if you can just sort of open up a little bit to those ideas, it might inform your design, it might inform what you're making and, and give you that sort of you, that uniqueness um, that other people uh, or may not have thought about, or, you know, maybe so there's some kind of edge that you would have. Um, but, but even if not, just to sort of be exposed to other possibilities uh, for what you can do uh, when you're designing games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously in addition to designing the different uh, ways of uh, interacting, which is you know clearly a pretty big priority, uh, yeah. what I found actually with specifically uh, with the owl, the fish, the maiden, and he is the um, the discovery of the idea to take somebody on a journey to. Uh, to uncover an idea, which I think is, uh, you know, not something that you commonly find in games that are, you know, engaged. Yeah. Maybe you discover the environment, maybe you can fulfill some goals, but not necessarily comprehend an idea. Um, so yeah, that, that was very cool. Um, well, you know, it was also the, just the idea of the, you know, the, you know, a, a lot, you know, often games are, are built around the idea of fantasy but i also want to say you know they can be they can be about so many different things i'm thinking about they can be about anything really but to sort of take my experiences and to sort of put those in a game uh and to say to them you can take your experiences and put those into a game or any media you want uh but to, to know that you have a resource within you um mm -hmm. that you can draw from very cool so um Going, uh, focusing a little bit more narrowly on um, the um, avatars, on the uh, dancing, the present, the uh, the avatars that sort of have appeared through your work as choreo bots, and but then also as embodiments <laughs> for somebody, you know, for yourself, and also yeah. for you know, like your grandmother in uh, the Hey Ma piece, right? What yeah. what is your relationship with uh, choreo bots these days, or with your virtual avatars? <laughs> how do you how do you relate to them and yourself as one? Yeah, um, so I think you know I'm I'm definitely fascinated with you know the movement of characters in a game, whether that's, you know, whether that's um, uh, Nolan North in Uncharted or whether it's, you know, just the, the dancers uh, or Marcel Marceau, uh, just, the, just, the, just the idea that of, 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 of that, the action, the movement, um, and then, you know, with with the release of Epic Games Metahumans, it was just, it was it was amazing because now you could do facial animation on the phone, you know, with with the iPhone 10 or, or later, and you can combine that with, um, with um, with you know, with with your tr traditional uh, motion capture, and and so for me, that was really exciting as as a tool um, to sort of to sort of be able to dive into some stories in a different way. And, you know, it, it wasn't that I was trying to necessarily do a voiceover. It wasn't a one-to-one. -one. So often, mm -hmm. so within uh, encounters, for instance, 
there's a section where there's a mouth moving, but there's the, what, what is being said is no relationship to what you're seeing. Um, but, you know, the idea that, you know, you can see these animations working and you can sort of get a feeling or a sense or a fami familiarity with them uh, is still very interesting to me. Um, you know, I, I remember at Ohio State playing The Sims a lot. Uh, and then, you know, that was, you know, I was really kind of like, you know, here we are just sort of playing with these, these digital puppets, these dolls, these, you know, uh -huh. and, uh, you know, what, 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 what can you do and what are they going to do in return? And, you know, there was a lot of, uh, I think, you know, that definitely had a lot of influence on me. Um, just to sort of have this big playground of, uh, of things that you can do and, and, and interactions and, you know, trying to make them look like you or your family or, or trying to set up different scenarios. And so I think that's still something that I'm, that I'm still doing, but I'm just sort of uh, doing it with my own, my own life and my own experiences. And, um, and also, you know, trying to think of like, you know, I love Bridgerton as a TV show, right? It's, it's such a, uh, interesting, weird, wacky thing, but you know, I'm also interested in like Afro surrealism and um, you know, just ways of like, just like telling stories that aren't necessarily based in reality, but also based in, in fantasy. And uh, and I think you know, for me, th th being able to sort of play around in these game in these game engines in these environments uh, is really, really is really helpful and wonderful. That is, that is, that is again, a very, very cool insight. So um, I want to bring to um, everybody's attention the, the book. Yes, I've, uh, you know, read uh, <laughs> the, the, the shells and your uh, um, interview and um, also other players and discovering this wonderful uh, world where, um, you know, games designed about and by and uh, with an idea, um, and what do you think anything is has been starting to change a little bit in the last two years? What are, uh, are there some um, new promises that are starting to come to fruition um, as, as a result of more focused attention on you know how 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 can we support black designers, uh, digital designers, in, in our particular field um, yeah. better? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I I think it's always uh, it's always a continuum, right? Uh, we're certainly um, uh, trying to, uh, you know, we we certainly have more tools, and we're certainly trying to make more work and and make more work about our experiences. One of the great things about this book is that it puts a lot of people together in one place, so that you can sort of go, if you want to know about Black designers, you can you can go to this book and you'll have those resources. Um, but, you know, everybody isn't necessarily working on a game at the moment, and sometimes they've worked on games in the past. Um, but I but I think, I mean, I hope that there is uh, some, some renewed interest um, in, in what Black people have to say in, in our experiences. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've certainly trying to sort of, with the work that I've been creating recently, just trying to, just trying to sort of tell a story mm -hmm. so that, that it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't seem such like so distant. Like, you know, if you know me, you know, some of the things that I've personally gone through uh, that I've personally experienced. Um, and so that you, so that it's so that it doesn't feel so abstract, you know. Sometimes, um, it, you know, we watch the local news, and the local news often be begins with stories of crime, and those crime usually, uh, whether it's um, a, a truthful representation or not, uh, mm -hmm. it, it it becomes a sort of overly focused on on black people or black men uh, as criminals or people committing crimes, um, and the the sort of way to combat that i think is to is to sort of uh you know tell the tell keep telling your stories keep trying to get those stories out there um it's a lot to overcome you know you know i you know if i was looking at the the census of uh, 2019 black people in this country are about 41 million compared to uh 239 million white people so you know you're trying to sort of create a narrative or uh, 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 
for a large number of people who may not have that much interaction with, with Black people, uh, with people of color. Uh, so it's easy to not, to not see it or to think that things are, you know, things are, have equaled out um, when, uh, when that's really just not the case. Um, and so for some people, it's, it's harder for them to see that. So the more we make our stories, the more we tell our stories, the more we put the information out there, um, I think hopefully the more things will begin to, to actually change. Thank you. And I'm, uh, you know, I personally find incredible inspiration in uh, the uh, Afro-surrealism and Afrofuturism, especially at times, um, something that resonated with me in uh, Hey Ma is this comment about you can talk about anything with your grandma, but not about the past. <laughs> and then we, mm, yeah, you know, yeah. it, it seems like we often uh, define the Black experience through it's past, but uh, you know, with yeah. technology, you have this unique opportunity to level the field and uh, you know invent yeah. the future and, and influence it. So it's, yeah, it's yeah, definitely yeah. A, a pretty important work. Um, so uh, I want to give a little heads up to our attendees. In about ten minutes, we're going to start our Q and A session. So please um, get your questions ready, and um, you know that will be an opportunity. Um, and in the meantime, um, I'm curious to see how your balance is a very sort of, um, <laughs> you know, pr question that I'm interested in uh, always is how to balance the creativity and the tech, right? We always get this uh, question of like, you know, we're excited about the gimmick, but how do we, you know, how do we make it more, um, you know, how do we engage with it creatively to achieve the synergy of the experience rather than the dazzling effect of the sh new shiny yeah. thing? <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I think that's what that's one of the hard questions, especially you know as as this new technology comes out and you know what do you do with it? And uh, a lot of times we just want to do the thing, but for me, I I feel like the 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 tech is. Well, office is, is, is so overwhelming because sometimes so much of it comes out so quickly and, and especially teaching it, it's just like, I'm like, I, what am I going to teach? Because now <laughs> I got to spend, you know, Unreal Engine 5 just came out. Now I got to spend a few months like really learning the differences between four and five. And uh, so that's a lot of sort of burden on my on my brain to sort of think about that just, just in terms of teaching, but then in terms of being creative, you know, they introduce all these new tools. And so now you can animate directly inside of Unreal. Okay, great. I don't have to go through Maya or, or Motion Builder necessarily, or maybe Motion Builder, but maybe not Maya or 3 ds Max. Uh, <laughs> but then that's another skill that I have to learn. Um, but the, the, the thing for me is always like the tech is not the goal. The tech is only the way that I get to telling the story, to, to, to getting the information across. And if the information isn't reading and I'm only showing the tech, uh, it, it falls flat in my four, my four um, principles of audience engagement. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it won't be transformative because I'm just showing the technology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it won't be surprising. It might be maybe it's surprising because technology has some surprising stuff, but it won't have the, the principle of simplicity because there's no sense of like, what what is going on and what am i what am i learning in this process so you know the other part of for me the simplicity is what am i what am, what am, what is the audience going to learn at the end of this process that they didn't know when they started um and so that's also a big part of you know what i strive for i don't say i think i always achieve it but it's certainly something i strive for to say i'm going to start this process at the end i'm going to have taught the audience something new. I'm going to do it in a way that's surprising. And I'm going to do it in a way that changes something about how they perceived whatever the beginning was at the end of this process. Right. That's so the technology is just, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to look like, you know, leave the technology uh, or, or let the technology be the technology. But then the, 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 the real important thing is what am I, what am I teaching them at the, by the end of this end of whatever they're, whatever they're seeing. All right. And what is the, what is minimally necessary to learn in order to, you know, receive or learn the, the sort of the con yeah. the message that is bigger than the means of its acquiring. 
Yeah, um, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. I sometimes yeah. feel a little envious of the uh, you know world of music and the idea that nobody questions how long it takes to learn a musical instrument before you can do something right. with it, right? Yeah, but exactly, it exactly. doesn't necessarily allow this luxury. Well, um, I think maybe a, um, <clears throat> a, a last question from me before I uh, would love to hear from uh, the attendees to leave enough time for that. Maybe, um, can you reflect a little bit uh, on sort of graduate school experience in terms of like, what were the most valuable things? What were the things that you would probably do different? And, uh, you know, what would you do if you were in, you know, in grad school now? <laughs> well, first, I would take more drum lessons. <laughs> 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 of course. Um, but no, I think I think one of the one of the beautiful things for me was that I that I um, that I got to just sort of have my vision and sort of see it through. Um, uh, I, I was, you know, working with, you know, choreography and I was working with technology um, you know, and I think that, you know, the, my abandoned revolution project was, was, uh, um, it was so, there was so much to it. Um, and I was so glad that I just got to explore all of those things, uh, whether they worked or not, you know, and, and I felt comfortable in failing at, at many of them. And so I just, I just, that, like that for me was really, was really one of the great things that I could just sort of have this idea work through it. I had a lot of help. I had a lot of people who were working with me on uh, on this um, on this project, um, and you know, I think I think the, the 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 great thing about grad school was that you know I just sort of took a break from my my you know my regular life and just was always focused on the arts and 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 being creative and um you know just having that time and space to sort of mull through ideas and take all those different classes uh with all the wonderful professors there uh to be at ACAD and to be around everyone there and to uh to have all those classes and resources available and you know, had to having Brian Windsor who was there with the mocap and, you know, that was, that was really one of the things that I really was so, um, I really was, you know, for me, it's like the, the idea of like doing motion capture, um, uh, you know, was, it was like so far from, you know, what I had thought I would be able to do uh, and, and, and to be able to sort of go in and sort of make these things and then play around with, you know, the different aspects of them to to take them into dance and to do um, the 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 sort of action uh, the laban stuff and the action theory and just to sort of play around with them and to see how they looked inside of a computer, which is different, you know. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't have the same fidelity as a human being, but that's not the point to me. The point is, uh, how much can you get across, and and what is this medium inside the computer? You know, we're we're just at the very beginning of of where you know digital computerized motion capture stuff is. You know, it's going to take a it's going to take a hundred years for us to get to where film is in that regard. I think. Um, but I had a great time, a really, really great time uh, in school, and I learned so much. And I'm really just sort of thankful for all of my ability to sort of go in and try stuff, and you know, meet those wonderful friends that I met, and collaborate, and or just go hang out in the short north and have a drink. You know, it's just <laughs> all of it was just really, really fun. So awesome. Um, okay, we're starting to get some questions in, so um, I'm going to <clears throat> start with that, and um, please keep them coming, because I, I have a ton more for, <laughs> for Boris, and uh, please don't let me um, miss some of uh, what you're curious about. Okay, a question. You referred to misperceptions stemming from lack of familiarity. Uh, for example, where Black violence leads the news and sets an avatar for Black lives. What outreach handshake avenues uh, do you follow and suggest for overcoming our multitude of personal and societal fragmented relationships? 
Well, uh, I don't know that I'm an expert in uh, <laughs> understanding all of the nuances of, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I have I have my experience. I have what I what I see, and what I read, um, and and you know I think that for me it's important to sort of tell my story, to tell my side of it. Um, but I think the uh, the way that you the, oh, so what can you do? Well, you can sort of um, you know uh, turn turn down the news, I think a lot of the times, a lot of times we get, we're so, we get so much information from so many different places. Uh, it's important to, to do that, but um, I think that um, uh, the news sometimes uh, paints a particular, paints a particular image. Um, and, you know, I can tell you stories of, you know, me getting stopped by police and, uh, and, you know, some the police on me, because they, they feel a lot of times, you know, the things that I'm doing to, to protect myself is, is a, is a lot of work to, to present myself in a way that it feels non-threatening as I'm sort of walking around the world. Um, so, so I would say, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, I can't really say like what you can do, but I can say notice the difference between when you're actually in danger and when you think that you're in danger. Uh, that could that could certainly uh, be helpful, and you know, also understand if you're if you have a, a preconceived idea, really check it out to see mm -hmm. if that's actually true. A lot of times um, we have things that we just sort of keep passing down um uh over over time as as truths and then they're not actually true so just, you know keep an open mind really mm -hmm. now that's a that's a very uh a very good um good insight into this um i am uh wondering uh, among many other things, <clears throat> have you thought of, you know, we have done a few things at ACAD here, sort of perspective taken virtual reality experiences. And um, what do you think about the possibility that VR offers to get some additional type of insight into, um, you know, any experience, but, you know, black uh, experiences in particular, maybe? Um, there, there are some of those out there yeah. that are, you know, yeah. really. So really there's a, there's a, I think my internet's a little unstable right now, but um, so there's some really great uh, VR experiences. One of them is traveling while black. Um, it it um, and you know seeing like seeing that experience going through that in VR, being able to sit down at you know at a table with someone. So it's more of a uh, 360 video than than uh, 3D graphics. Uh, but it do, it does something about VR does sort of change somewhat your perspective, somewhat your your closeness to um, to these to these kinds of events. Um, there was another great one um, uh, called "I Am a Man." I am a man. Uh, yes, that's the one that yeah. the, the first one that I've experienced has been a really you know a really good one um especially yeah. because you know looking down at your hands you see your your hands as a black man and all of a sudden it's yeah. a, you know it's the type of experience that you do not otherwise have yeah 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 exactly no that was very inspiring i remember when i saw that um I actually met the developer at the east um at the uh east coast games conference Derek and Ham, uh, yeah. yeah yeah um and so i I was really inspired to do VR. I never did it, but that that was one of the things that made me say, "Okay, this is really this is a really powerful medium." Um, and I haven't I, I haven't actually played around with it, but I'm but I am I have ideas, but mm -hmm. my, my, mainly they're just Derek's ideas right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I haven't found my own idea yet. But that's also um, another really uh, not necessarily about. Um, uh, about black experiences, but uh, Tender Claws has a game um, called uh, The Under Presents, and they have and they do within that Shakespeare's The Tempest. So they take mm -hmm. you on this experience with a live performer in real time, 
And something like that could be really amazing. Um, I never, and, and that's what I would really love to do, something like that. I know I don't have the, the skills to do it. So that's part of why I haven't actually done anything like that. But Maybe if I could do something like that, happen, yeah. <laughs> you definitely have to collaborate for sure. But I think those kinds of experiences are really, you know, really powerful. And I think VR is, is powerful in that regard because you can, you know, um, you can really be up close. You, it, it gives you a different feeling. Of course, you still have, you know, it has a lot of problems, the heaviness of the, the thing, the you know, tons, of, tons of problems. Yes. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But at least it gives you that, that, that feeling of like, okay, uh, at some point you, you could have um, an insightful and informative experience. That's really powerful. Um, but you know, at the same time, you know, there, as much as as much as there's a lot of pro, like let's change the world for the better. There's also a lot of let's not change the world for the better out there. So there's always that balance that of of, of like you know that's why progress is always slow, um, because there's always pushback and there's always backlash from a certain amount of progress, um, and so that's that's why it's a little. You know, that's why it's a little like hard to say, like, you know, how can like you think that we can just figure things out, but not not necessarily so easy. Yeah. Well, I think I have a question that may be tangentially related to this is the idea of uh, what important lessons um, are to be learned from failures and setbacks. Uh, you know, you've, you know, clearly has been have been successful in many different, you know, directions of your work but um what what is to be learned from the times when things don't yeah. work out or when we have to go to step one yeah no failure is is the key to to learning uh that was the the one thing that i that i figured out as as the goal you know I, we're like we're in school and you know we're i'm a professor and teaching and it's like they're not learning if they're not failing and they can't fail if if the expectation is always if, is only success so we have a real kind of problem i think that that to sort of deal with just sort of say try this see what you can do with it if it doesn't work um I don't know, maybe try again next year. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but this idea that 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 you, if you to do something to fail at it to try it try try something new. Um, I, I don't know, I feel like there, there it, it is it is where all the learning occurs it is, you know, I think that's why games were so uh, that's why the gamification movement. Um, was so sort of glommed on to the idea of video games because what happens in a video game is you go and you die and you die and you die and you die and you keep trying things you keep trying it and trying it and trying it until you figure out the one or two solutions that are possible and and why do you keep playing those games after you're dying and dying and failing and failing and failing because something about that failure is teaching you something, something about it is, is drawing you in, um, you know, the, it's, it's, it is, it is the thing that I think that is, that is the thing that is, is, is most important in the process. Um, and to fail without consequences, I think one of the, one of the most important things that games do for us as as an island away from our real life to be able to go into a game play it and fail without consequence is something that i think we as humans mm -hmm. really crave and really need uh and which is why i think you know games exist and for games and education to have the opportunity to formally reflect upon your failures not just uh, experience yeah, yeah, yeah. safety but to you know meaningfully reflect and uh, yeah and, exactly and, exactly know. that that would be so you know in my in my idea of an education system you know you would you would be trying things and failing at them but you know you wouldn't necessarily be punished for the for mm -hmm. your failures mm -hmm. you would be rewarded for your failures um for uh, sure but that's that's, that's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that, change the entire really... education system. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, in the remaining one minute <laughs> that we have before we have to <laughs> 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 
switch um, uh, back to Scott for some clo uh, clo uh, closing remarks. Uh, David Morneau said, says hello, we're glad to see him. He was uh, one of uh, our mutual collaborators actually on some yes, of the projects. Yes. So um, great to see um, him doing the good work out there. And, awesome. Hi, know, David. Um, just uh, super quickly, so you're balancing, you know, academia and private artistic practice and private, you know, um, commissions, uh, you know, commercial practice, any ever any temptation to just sort of go into one direction or do you like this sort of uh, the multifaceted uh, <laughs> life that you live? No, I like I like the multifaceted life. I like, you know, I like writing poems and songs and uh, you know, then seeing how I can put those into the digital world and, you know, uh, just all of those ideas. I was really inspired by Alan Nikolai, uh, the choreographer and uh, all of the thing makers. Uh, yeah. I sort of sort of like that idea of the total theater that he had created. And so for me, it's like, I just, you know, every time I have an idea, I just want to explore it and see, see where it leads me. So, um, I'm not necessarily thinking I'm just going to do that one thing, uh, which is a problem in my life because <laughs> then I'm always trying to learn something new. But yeah, I'll, I, I love I love all the different things that that, uh, that come into my mind as as a creative and uh, as an artist. Well, thank you. You're a very inspiring artist, and thank you for thank this you. Uh, interview and all that you had to share today. Um, I think it's uh, let's see. Um, there's one uh, comment. Uh, hi, Boris. Uh, this is actually uh, from, from Susan Petrie. Um, hi, Boris. Thank you. And great to hear all of this. I appreciate the simplicity, surprise, transformation, repetition. This is this uh, your structure and principles you have evolved or uh, where uh, some of the influences came from. Um, I, w this answer may have to be coming um, in, you know, in post, as we say, <laughs> because yes. we have only two minutes, and I fear uh, Scott has uh, to wrap this up because we're, you know, cut off dead at, you know, on the dot. So this right. is to okay. be continued, which is the way okay. we want to leave all our interviews. <laughs> so thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Vita and Boris, thank you both so much for your time and the gift of this conversation. Uh, so inspiring, Boris, to hear so much of your work and the way that you see and hear and interact and engage with the world that obviously is not only specific to your, uh, your artistic endeavors, but cut across so many important artistic endeavors and, and human endeavors, really, in that regard. So very inspiring and great to be reminded of and informed about those things. We're, we're again, grateful to call you one of our own here at Ohio State. Uh, thank you again all for joining us today. We hope that you've enjoyed this series. Uh, you'll be hearing it from us in a follow-up uh, email uh, in the coming days. Uh, until then, be well, and as we like to say here, stay close to the arts. Bye now.